Okay, before I start preaching, I just have to say that it is so amazing to look out and see everybody gathered here. My, like, faith in the world has, like, been buoyed a hundred points <laughs> just walking in the door. Um, about ten years ago, a man asked me if he could shadow me for a week. I don't remember his name, but I remember that I was very flattered. It felt important having someone follow me around and watch as I, all I did as principal of an inner city school. And he did. He watched me comfort children and deal with crises and evaluate teachers and create schedules. At the end of the week, he wrote me a note. He said something to the effect of, thank you for letting me shadow you. I'm really impressed by your stamina. I was mortally offended. I had been praised in my life for my public speaking, my strength in forming relationships with young people, my ability to build partnerships with parents, and he was saying, at least you showed up. It seemed like the one quality that one did not really want to be admired for. And then about two years ago, I watched a TED talk I deeply admire by Elizabeth Gilbert called My Elusive Genius. It changed my idea about just showing up. She writes, centuries ago in the deserts of North Africa, people used to gather for these moonlight nights of sacred dance and music that would go on for hours and hours until dawn. They were always magnificent because the dancers were professionals, but every once in a while, very rarely, something would happen. And one of these performers would actually become transcendent. I know you know what I'm talking about because I know you've all seen at some point in your life a performance like this. It was like time would stop and the dancer would sort of step through some kind of portal. And he wasn't doing anything different than he'd done a thousand nights before, but everything would align. And all of a sudden, he would no longer appear to be merely human. He would be lit from within and below and above. And when this happened back then, people knew it for what it was. They called it by its name. They would put their hands together and they would start to chant, Allah, 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 God, God, God. Curious historical footnote, when the Moors invade southern Spain, they took this custom with them, and the pronunciation changed over the centuries from Allah, 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 to Ole, 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 which you still hear in bullfights and in flamenco dances. In Spain, when a performer has done something impossible and magic, people call out, Allah, ole, ole, magnificent, bravo, a glimpse of God. But the tricky bit comes the next morning for the dancer himself when he wakes up and discovers that it's Tuesday at 11 a.m. and he's no longer a glimpse of God. He's just an aging mortal with really bad knees. And maybe he's never going to ascend to that height again. And, nobody, and maybe nobody will ever chant God's name again as he spins and what is he then to do with the rest of his life? This is hard. This is one of the most painful reconciliations to make in a creative life. But maybe it doesn't have to be quite so full of anguish if you never happen to believe in the first place that the most extraordinary aspects of you came from yourself. Maybe if you just believed that those extraordinary aspects were on loan to you from some other source, for some exquisite portion of your life to be passed along when you're finished. If we think about it this way, it starts to change everything. What we all have to do is keep telling ourselves, don't be afraid, don't be daunted, just do your job. Continue to show up for your piece of it, whatever that might be. If your job is to dance, do your dance. If the divine genius assigned to your cause decides to let some sort of wonderment be, glanced, be glimpsed for just one moment through your efforts, then ole. And if not, do your dance anyhow, and ole to you nonetheless. I believe this and feel we must teach it. Ole to you nonetheless for just having the sheer human love and stubbornness to keep showing up. That's what I've been thinking about so much this Lent, about the fact that showing up is actually not the most minimal thing you can do, but perhaps the best and the greatest. Perhaps the only thing that can really be asked of us is that again and again we show up, 
to do the job, knowing that God may work through us that day. How do we have the sheer human love and stubbornness to keep showing up for God? I think that's what Len is about. It's about adopting a spiritual practice so real and so powerful that it deepens our relationship with God. What can you do? Can you make a list of 20 people and things in the world and pledge 10 minutes a day to sit down and pray for them? Can you watercolor or sing hymns or listen to a podcast for a half hour a day for these 40 days? Can you stop on your car on your way home and watch the sunset and praise God? Can you pause at night when you're walking your dog and look at the stars and be overwhelmed by how small you are and how important? Can you say for 40 days, I'm going to intentionally add this tiny commitment to my practice so as to show up for God? Jesus goes out into the wilderness. It's a common thing in scripture, this wilderness. There's something realer, more ferocious out there. Wild animals hunger on the way to the promised land. It's the wilderness. Jesus goes there. He too is showing up, is trying to puzzle through this thing he's been asked or offered or required to do. The devil is there at his elbow, a voice at his side, pleading, swindling, bribing. You don't have to do this. What the devil has to convince Jesus is that his life is going to be about what he does, about how other people perceive him, as opposed to about being loved by God. And Jesus is tempted. Last summer, Michael and I spent a fair amount of time at a small church up in the midst of scrub pines in Weldfleet called the Church of St. James the Fisherman. The rector there is a woman named Tracy Lind, who was the Bishop of Ohio and now has early onset dementia. She is an amazing preacher, and she posed a question this summer again and again. Who are you if you cannot do anything? Who are you if you cannot remember your circumstances, if you cannot have a job or an identity? Who are you if you don't even remember that there is a God? What do you mean then? What is your value then? According to our God, to our tradition, your value is still infinite. Your being is still great. You are still beloved, deeply beloved. As the great Henry Nouwen preached in a sermon he called Being the Beloved, the three great lies of the tempter, the three lies that call us to turn away from God's chosen identity for us as God's children are, we are what others say about us, we are what we possess, and we are what we do. We spend our whole lives being turned here and there by these lies until we turn our face back to God's love for us. Jesus is in the desert and he's hungry. And the voice says, you can turn these stones into bread. You can feed yourself and others. Don't depend on God, depend on yourself. As Dr. Hillary Raining says, this lie tells us that we are only as good as the last thing we produced or earned. This lie turns us into people who can only feel good about ourselves when we are doing something. And we turn away from the love of God that tells us that we are loved no matter what. We never have to earn God's love. We are not what we do. So then the voice tempts Jesus with the idea of power, of adulation. You are what others say you are. Jesus reminds the devil that to be worshiped and flattered and glorified is to forget that God's love needs to be proclaimed in this world. The minute we have to hang on to others' praise, we walk away from the idea that our first job is to stand up for God, to show up for God, to walk in the way of love. Finally, the voice takes Jesus to the Jewish temple, the center of his identity as a Jew. The devil showed Jesus what he had that was the most precious and sacred. His religion, his family, his health, his very identity. The devil shows Jesus everything, everything Jesus has and says, this is who you are. We cling so hard to the lie that we are what we have, our possessions, our education, our social status, and even to those things that go deeper, our health, 
our family, our religion, but ultimately, and this is what Tracy Lynn so poignantly reminded me all summer, ultimately we are not even those deepest parts of our identity. They are not the things that give us value. Ultimately, we are God's creations and we are loved. And it is this knowledge that we should rest in. God is trying to share with us that knowledge, but we can't hear it. We're too distracted by the voices in our heads. So show up for Lent, set some time aside and say, God, I know you love me every day in a way no one has ever loved me. And I know you do not love me because of what I do. And I know you do not love me because of my reputation or of what I have. You love me for me. Every year it happens in my class, some kid in February catches, catches on fire. Having come through a couple of quarters with D's and F's and a general attitude of, you can bring it to me, but I'm not doing anything with it, suddenly something changes. Sometimes it's a high school he wants to get into. Sometimes it's a mother she wants to please. Occasionally, a genuine curiosity bug gets lit and they just can't stop reading or thinking. But they invest. Start doing homework and thus know enough to contribute to discussion. Start participating in the discussion and suddenly care if they can word their argument correctly. Mrs. Daly, I did the homework again. And I pretend to hyperventilate and be shell-shocked and generally fall all over them with praise and thanksgiving. I get worn down by my job, by the roller coaster of 14-year-old beings, the flirtation, the melancholy, the hormones, the drama. But I will never get tired of this, these awakenings, this showing up. It happens every year for a few kids. Unclear who it will be at the beginning of the year or why it happens, but it is magic to watch. And we need some magic. It seems we've emerged from the horror of COVID to step into the plight of the Ukraine, the whims of a madman pouring down on a people who long only to be free. We can pray for them, we can send money, but there is a feeling that they and their suffering are so far away, that they are so hard to help. So my advice is in the onslaught of these days, show up for Lent. Forget the angry God of your childhood demanding you give up dessert. As the Muslims say, there are 99 names for God. There are so many aspects of God, so many ways to know God. He is, God is vast, merciful beyond measure. Take time to remember your belovedness. The rest will follow. Show up that God's love might shine through you. Olay.